speaking in working man's clubs. He was one of the first men who went to the average guy on the street to say, look, can you try to improve your diet? Uh, don't drink this beer that they're handing you at these Templar-run inns. He tried to break it down, and he drove himself into the ground. He actually died from exhaustion. Do you know that? From going from Russia to every country where working man would listen to him to say, there is this secret establishment that is causing you to be the way you are. Don't fall for this communism. Don't fall for this Marxism. Don't fall for these... Blavatsky did the same thing, warning about the Jesuit Brotherhood, warning about the British establishment. So it's, it's, it's absolutely horrific to me to see this happen. And, and you, you'd think that people would know better since every single thing you can imagine has been duplicated. Mm-hmm. There's a whole, the whole, our world is filled with duplications of great men's work, for goodness sake. Ever heard of Muzak? Right, we're in a Muzak world. And so people have done very little homework will blame these great people for their open-mindedness and for their genius. And then these, their works get sabotaged and plagiarized and cannibalized, and then they get the blame. You know, it's really sad. Exactly. I mean, she was, was she, I don't know what your view is on this, but wasn't she influenced by the um, hermetic brotherhood of Luxor? That I don't know. I think so. I, th- I have to look into that. But I think she was, again, a person who studied lots and lots of different traditions. Yeah. And again, you know, again, one could argue that she was, uh, you know, wrong to even form an organization. She should have just kept her studies private, whatever. That's all biographical stuff, you know. It's, it's, it was her own gig. It was what she wanted to do. You know, I'm not, I'm not a believer in that at all. The institutionalization or collectivization of any kind of knowledge. So as I say, you know, I've got major differences with a lot of the people that I research. But again, I know not to start fighting and bickering over this minutia. Take out the gold that this person has given you, that this person has discovered with their own life, and, and, and take that forward. Grab the baton and carry on. There's so much need to move forward in this, to continue to be up to speed on things, that you don't have time to sit there and niggle, like the, you know, like the Three Stooges, over absolute minutia. That's it. Speaking on merit. Check out northeasttruth.com and tnsradio.ning.com. Um, at some point in the very near future in this, um, this show, we're going to start looking at our questions from our audience. Now, the, the track was Fatboy Slim, Weapon of Choice. And there's a quote in there, um, or rather a sample, not a direct sample from the film, but it, the film uh, June, and it's Walk Without Rhythm So You Do Not Awake the Worm. Um, Michael, what can, you, what can you say about that one? Well, first of all, the book and the movie, to me, are deeply inspiring. Um, I think that Frank Herbert, as far as I, I, my opinion is that he actually, within his work, goes to the roots of what what evil is and where it came from, by the way. It's not obvious, but it's in there. He already cracked it. As far as I'm concerned, he had the answer. But the, the part that you're speaking about comes towards the end of the film, where there's this amazing scene, uh, which is basically born out of Zen and Taoist philosophy, the worm being a metaphor for the adversary, uh, but also coming out of uh, the teachings of William Blake and others, where the word worm was often used as a metaphor for the actions of the mind. Yeah. Or let's say the, 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 the more pernicious um, aspects of ego consciousness or existence it ties in with my theories on the Mysterium again, so people who up on speed on the Disciples of the Mysterium will get what I'm talking about. There's positive and negative aspects of egohood. And the worm is just a metaphor for the thoughts of man, the part that uh, deceives, the part that leads him away from the deeper voice. Now, they're and crossing the, the desert, shot. which is, again, you know, the, the desert being another metaphor for the great journey, the hero's journey. Whether you're talking about the fool, or you're talking about you know the underworld descent of Horus or whatever... So you see this young prince and his mother, and it's very significant, by the way, that he is with his mother. It's a great great uh, typological metaphor from ancient mythology. And then he basically throws her this uh, warning, try to walk without rhythm in your steps so that you won't attract the worm. This is enormous, and basically the only thing I can really say about it at this point, it's so deep and esoteric, but it basically is coming again out of this Zen idea, this Taoist idea, that reality, what, what, the way to understand what real reality is, not a person's ideas of reality, is that reality is not fixed. All the idioms of scientism and theology and even most other religious and mystical so-called yogic paths are always trying to find a plateau, 
an unshakable Archimedean, what's known in philosophy as an Archimedean point, in order to stand and view reality. Uh, at different eras, that Archimedean point has been different things. In the Platonic era, it was what was called the forms. It, later on, it became reason, the reason of man. Uh, later on, it became, you know, sort of like a uh, the pragmatism, the senses. Now it's you know now now it's considered the molecular universe or whatever it might be. For Christians, it's the God, it's the Jesus. There's all sorts of what I call mysteria out there that have are people's attempt to build these towers of Babylon in order to stand there phallically and view reality through an unchanging lens. And unfortunately, the circuitry of the mind lends itself to this, or at least, at least post-traumatic ego consciousness does. The kind of consciousness we have after these devastations we were speaking about earlier definitely lends itself to that fixed point, and we're addicted to it. We don't even think about it. But yeah. the real reality, with a capital R, is ever changing. It is never the same. It is also not necessarily hierarchical, even though there are elements of hierarchical structure within it. It is ultimately nagantropic, self sustaining, ever changing. So, in order to really know reality, you've got to avoid that um, fixity yeah. of the ideas of reality. You know? it, it makes you wonder whether that fixation came from the very process of the, the end deluge thing, because I suppose you would naturally gravitate towards any fixed point in which to survey your surroundings, wouldn't you? Right. It's exactly. It's like a spastic muscle. Yeah. If somebody's going to physically fall, everything goes spastic. It's exactly the same with consciousness. It's a metaphor to show that consciousness became fixed. And yeah. it, both good and bad, if it didn't become fixed, we wouldn't even have a consciousness. We would have been totally lost in the same way that psychotic people or insane people are today. We, the whole of mankind would have been like that. Some people could argue they already are. Uh, yeah. But it's bad because, unfortunately, that new center was not the real center. It's an epicenter, and it's limited in its powers. And that's what we know as the ego uh, consciousness. And again, the, then you, from that point, you go into all the different schools of psychology to see, you know, all these, you have to now negotiate all the different theories and, and schematas of the ego. You know, it takes you into the whole world of psychology after that point. But I, in the talk on Conspiracy Con, I was able to get a few anecdotes in about the so-called hidden observer and again, we didn't have time to explore it, but the hidden observer is that true self. Uh, they had to give it some term, and these were clinicians, remember, so they were very, very loath to term that hidden observer by its true term, which is self, which is soul, which is the true self of a person. So they just came up with this neutral term, the hidden observer, but it's basically nothing less than the self of a man that is there in the background, and it's, it's it doesn't have much of a voice, except now and again through dreams and what have you, or in special people. The rest of us are out here in the world of the persona. Yep, that's it. Yeah. Uh, you could argue it's the moral center or even the voice of God, I suppose. That in the sense it tells you the difference between right and wrong in one way of perceiving it, I guess. No, I wouldn't agree with that because when you, when you bring up the question of morality, you're in very dangerous waters because morality, as Nietzsche would have put it, is mostly a social convention which enables a man to function in this false world of the persona and all the different you know, social interactivities he has. Yeah. Uh, and that is a product of his superego or, again, the ego that faces the world. He would argue that that morality structure doesn't exist at all in that other place. That, but he also emphasized that there is a higher morality there. It's the morality that is so super moral in a way that makes the other morality seem very foul in comparison. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. I know what you're saying. What it really means is that the man who is finally connected to himself and who is an intimate rapport with his own selfhood, who is no longer, in other words, self-sadistic, is hardly going to act sadistically towards anyone or anything else. So in one way, it is that mega morality of the greater man that Christians might want to call the compassion that they speak about. When they speak about that compassion, then you might be right that, yeah, when you tap into that higher self, you see all man as being lost in delusion. And just out of your mere impulse to save them from the error of their own ways, you move towards enlightening them. But it's not the same moral code as that which galvanizes people in their daily interactivity and their mercurial interactions. You know, so there's, there's a yeah. debate over, over that. Yeah. 
Probably moral was the wrong word anyway, I think. Yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. It's like it, 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 it's a it's a product of our environment, isn't it? Obviously, if we if we grew up on, in a different place with completely different surroundings, then we'd have a different moral code, and we might not know the difference between right and wrong. It all depends on on how we're sort of you know. Condi- yeah, go back to go back go back to the Book of Exodus where uh, what was it? If if a wife. Oh my God! If a wife commits adultery, you know, it's like immediately put to death on the spot, and it doesn't even go so far as adul- adultery. It's just a rumor of adultery. Yeah. Or go over to go over to Baghdad right now, or, or Iran right now, and check out what'll happen to you if you, you know. Yeah, that's it. Um, break the rules. Before we uh, move on to another subject, and I know we've got a few people waiting to um, fire some questions in, possibly one or two live. Going back to um, the original question that set you off on on this on this um, this path of conversation, you mentioned the fool actually, in relation to uh, June, which I wasn't expecting. Now, the way of the fool is something I definitely want to get into shortly. Um, but while we touched on um, Ireland and Egypt and Atlantis, um, we've got a question from Dean, which um, you might be able to cover briefly. Um, if Obviously, looking at the Irish origins of, 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 of civilization, um, the question carries on and says, if, if we assume Egypt was the origin, because it is the center of the landmass of Pangaea, but before the pole shift of 12,000 years ago, do you think Ireland was at the center, and how would that affect the location of Atlantis? Well, uh, I have no doubt about the fact that Atlantis was where most people do say it was, yeah. which is in the North Atlantic, and it included the land masses of what we know to be Britain, uh, uh, yeah, Britain, uh, Norway and Scandinavia, and Iceland and Greenland and Siberia. That entire land mass up there, or a good huge part of what is Greenland, Iceland, and Britain, was part of Atlantis. What happened to those land masses, every specialist has a different idea. There's some people who say it sank beneath the waves, with others go, no, that's geologically not possible, blah, 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 blah. We can get into all of that. It's really, to me, it's largely immaterial. The fact is, it isn't there anymore. But yeah. the, the memory of it is. And then, so Egypt is just one of these colonies, to speak very specifically of what I wrote in the book, is that the northwest, which would, would have been Atlantis or Hyperborea or T- Ultima Tula or Avalon, whatever you want to call it, was hit so badly. And you can see the evidence in Argyllshire. You can see the evidence up there in Scotland. It, it was devastated more than any other place in the world. The fossil record, even the official Geologists like uh, Agizes and Lyle, they even have accepted this, that the lands of the northwest, Britain, were, and the forests of uh, uh, the Arctic, this was where the greatest cataclysms took place. And it basically denuded the habitat, meaning that the people who were or aboriginal who lived there, who would have been the descendants of the Atlanteans, had to leave. And not only that, but even in the subsequent turmoils, because the devastation in the, in the ancient times was so bad that there was recurrent uh, cataclysms, we know this, and therefore there was waves and waves of people who left the British Isles to move down into Europe and the East, so this accounts for what have been called the Celts, this accounts for the uh, incredibly interesting group, the Hurrians, the Hittites, the Babylonians, Sumerians, Amorites, and, uh, and ultimately the Egyptians. Uh, these great civilizations, I believe, were transported, in fact, even it's been now discovered that the cave paintings in Lascaux just like Commons Beaumont always said they would, they were not by cave people. They were actually by sophisticated Nordic and British people who, while residing in those caves temporarily, meaning on their way elsewhere, but having to take shelter from the cataclysms, the aftermath of these cataclysms, lived temporarily in these caves and then drew on the cave walls the animals that were common in North Europe at that time, which is what happened. And we know this now because they found identical cave drawings in Egypt dated to 15,000 years B.C., Identical. Now, wait a minute. I, by the officialdom, those paintings in Lascaux are meant to be just cave-dwelling primitives. What are they doing? The exact same dis- paintings discovered recently. We only discovered two years ago. I have it on the forum uh, in, in Egypt. Ident- identical images, and they were 15,000 years dated. So we know that 15,000 years and prior to that, which ties in beautifully with the, 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 the consensus over when these catastrophes took place. 